Well, guys, grab a Bible and make your way this morning. We are in uh, just there in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be there actually con- just completing a study that we've been doing in this section that deals with spiritual warfare, with the armor of God. And today, as we make our way here, it's kind of the final study in that whole section, which is always exciting and sad at the same moment, but so longing that God has worked in that for you. Again, hoping you got a Bible. If not, there's Bibles around you. Page number on the screen. You can get there rapidly. You can use an electronic device. That works as well. And just giving the same invitation to you who are in our overflow and then you who are online right now, that this would be a space that you grab hold of a Bible. And that as we look at this together, you would look at it. And it would be a space where God meets you through just the authority and the power of his word. So let's take a moment right now with that open before us and let's do what we do each week and let's ask God for that. Let's ask that he would take his truth and meet you and me in a way that by his spirit, we hear what he has for us. Father, right now, we just present this time to you and our lives. We're opening up your word and Lord, that's so filled with potential for you tell us that your word is powerful. Your word is alive. God, we need that. We need to to hear what you're speaking to us. And I pray for that this morning, that you would grant us favor, that we would understand what it is you're communicating. But we'd also hear your voice speaking to us, what you would say to us individually, that we would hear your voice. Holy Spirit, work that here, work that now. We're asking for your help as we submit this time to you. We do that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, that's a benediction. That's a a blessing given there in Romans 15, and yet it's a right one for us to think through right now. That he tells us, hey, our God is a God of hope. He's a God who is the God of hope. And he says, I want you to have that joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope. I love that. I love that reality. I love what that is, and I long for that to be a part of that. As we've journeyed in this series through the spiritual warfare, through Ephesians 6, I have said it every week. Because definitely one of the things that I felt the Lord lead as we went into this short study in the uh, spiritual warfare and armor of God over these last few weeks is that God would give us hope. That there would be a sense that in the midst of everything else, that in a time where hope sometimes feels to be draining away, that you would find yourself actually having hope, not because of what's happening around you, but because of the God, who is the God of hope. And so I just want to say it again, I'm just longing for that to be true, and even as we just approach that this morning, longing that God would reinforce that which we've seen. So we've been kind of journeying through this, and every week as we've began over the last few weeks, we've kind of just reviewed where we've been, and kind of a quick overview of at least the key points, let's do that again. So turn back to verse 10 if you have to turn a page or just look up on the page if it's on the same page for you and begin there as we notice the section that we've been covering. He says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That's where there's hope. That's where there's strength that God is inviting you and I to that. And we've titled this series that, Be Strong in the Lord, that there would be a sense that you would recognize that's what God is inviting us to, to a place of strength, to a place where we could be literally strengthened, not that we're strong in ourselves, but His strength is being given to us. Why? Well, He tells us. Notice verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. God lets us know in this section that you and I are involved in something that is almost hard to even fully grasp. 
that there's a very real spiritual war, a war that's happening behind the scenes, a war that is really the thing that is affecting our world, that he tells us our battle is not with flesh and blood. Our problem is not people. Our problem is not governments or politicians or media. Those are, those are all just kind of pawns, if you almost want to think about it in the midst of it. The real power behind it is the devil and his demonic forces that literally have sway over this world. Now, that's true for all, but there's a battle for you in the midst of it. He tells us that you're wrestling in it, that this is something where Satan is at work against your life, and so he's telling us, hey, that's something that we have, and yet in this, he invites us to take up the entire armor of God so that we can be strong. Notice there in verse 13, it says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. It is, one more time, a message of hope. He's telling us that in God's strength that's being offered to us, we can stand. That in the, the waves of, of stuff that's happening in our world, he says, there's a way that you can be left standing. I mean, that you can stand through all that's happening and all that's real and, and all that's taking place in this, and he's inviting us into that place of doing that. Well, the way he tells us to do that one more time is to take up all that he's offering us. And he pictures it there, again in verse 13, by taking up the whole armor of God. And then he goes through and gives us just a picture of that. Seven pieces, if you want to think about it that way, that kind of are metaphors for the strength that God is offering into our lives. Let's just go back and read them. It says in verse 14, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication and the Spirit being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So over the last number of weeks, we've worked through and we've covered every one of these seven realities, things that are God's strength in our life. And there's a piece of me that just wants to go back over all of it again, but it would take too much of our time. But I just want to tell you, this is God that his truth, that the righteousness of God that's in Christ, the, the peace that we, that we have a, that to proclaim in this broken world, that we have that, this place of believing God, this place of just trusting him, this place of having his word and, his, and prayer, all of these things become God's supply in our life. If any of those are lacking or things that you don't understand, hey, technological age, go back and see it. Go back and follow it. Go back and dive in so that you're looking and thinking, okay, this is what he's offering. That's what I need. And I want to be a part of that. I, I, I want him to have that because he's offering this to you. If he's telling us that this, if he's commanding you to be strengthened, then it's possible for you to be strengthened with everything that he's offering. Well, we covered those again in detail. We went over them, and hopefully they're there. But I want to draw your attention to the last one, the one that we spent time on last week, where he invited us to always be praying. And we talked about how that in one sense, this is the one that weaves itself through all the others. That though some are others are have and some are take, this is always, there's something about it that becomes maybe the key to unlocking all that God has for us is to be a people of prayer. And we ended just with that thought last week for those who are here, just that place of that hymn, oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And it's just so true. It's just so true that we fail so often to walk in that that would give us the greatest strength possible, that it is to be a people who depend upon God, who pray to Him. And that's, again, what He has now laid out for us. And yet He gives us here a small addendum, that not only are we to be praying with all prayer, but very specifically to be praying for those in ministry as they walk through that. Well, let's go back and see it. So pick it up there in verse 19, where he just said, hey, you're praying with all prayer. And then he says, 
and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak it boldly as I ought to speak. So in the midst of this place of prayer, again, Paul says, hey, if you're going to be praying for people, make sure you pray for me. Interesting enough, Paul does this in almost every letter that he writes, just asking people to do that. It's definitely a piece of, of, of his heart, but maybe one of the keys for us right now is it's still part of the message that we've been hearing. That is, we're thinking about this spiritual warfare and we're thinking about the armor of God, we haven't left that subject matter, and we know that for a couple reasons. For starters, I mean, just go back and notice with me, if you have your Bibles there, that in the beginning of verse 19, we are entering into the middle of a sentence. It begins there, and it says, and for me, and it's a continuation of the sentence that we've been going. We haven't even closed that Now, quick FYI, in case you happen to have the NIV translation here this morning, uh, they did break it up into a couple sentences. It's not really that way in the original. The NIV is a little bit more loose with that. Even then, though, I think you can see it, that even then it, it is an inclusive term that begins that. But here again, I want you to understand, in the original, and here's where it is, we have not even closed the sentence, so we certainly haven't closed the subject. Again, that's just helpful for us to begin to think through that as we're thinking about this, as we're thinking about spiritual warfare and all that it is, he's inviting us to be in prayer specifically for those who are active serving in ministry. So let's just explore this for a few moments. Let's think through what this is. I guess I want to just help you to think through the connection. I want you to see the connection. Now, I've already told you it's there grammatically that in one sense we get to see it still in the same sentence, we're obviously still on the same subject, but I want to ask you a different question. Why? Why is this still a part of the same subject? What makes this request for prayer from Paul to them, this place where he's inviting that, still so much a part of it? Well, certainly there is a reality, if we could imagine it, if we could see there's a spiritual war that's happening around the world, the hot spots, if you want to think about it that way, is where God is doing a good work, wherever that's happening. I mean, think about it that way. We are involved in a war. That is true. And like any war, whether you're imagining World War II or something like that, there's a war, and then there are battles. There are key battles that are taking place that that where it's really, you know, just kind of a hot spot of warfare. If you could imagine that worldwide right now, if you could look around and see, okay, so there is a war that Satan is waging in our world today? Where are the hot spots? Where are the places where that he seems to be particularly active in? Well, there's a lot of them, but one of those places that you would note is where the work of God is happening, where the gospel is going forward, where people are serving in places. That's where Satan is not only active, but he's actively resisting. That if you could see a war then you would say, okay, those are places where the battle is in a high, just kind of, you know, place of impact and place that you need to see and that place where you need to be able to walk in. Okay, so there's a little bit of a connection there. Think about it even more. I want you to see that the connection isn't just that it's a spiritual war, but then in a sense, the effective power is spiritual. Now, we've been reasoning through this every week. I am not sure I've convinced you but I know I have tried, that there is a sense that we, when we think about evil and we think about what's happening in our world today, what God presents to us here is our problem is not people, that our battle is not with flesh and blood, that we could look behind that and say, okay, those are not really the big deals today. Those are not really the the earth-moving and life-changing, eternity-affecting realities. Behind the scenes, there's a devil. And that's really the big deal. I think about how he would say it there in 1 John, where he says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. I mean, that's true. That was true then. It is certainly true now. But I've wanted you to believe that. I've wanted you to understand that God is telling us that when we think about you know, what's moving this world in wickedness, that you would not find yourself believing the lie or the kind of misfocus that it's about personalities or politics. But you would say, no, no, that's not really my enemy. 
I have a doubt. The devil's real. And I, I see that that's the true battle. If you can grasp that, and I'm not even convinced I've, con- I've convinced you of that, but again, I've certainly tried. It's certainly there. It's certainly what the Bible tells us. But if you can see that, then I want you to also see not only is that true on the side of evil, it's true on the side of good, that the power that is changing this world for good, it's not people. It's the power of God. It's the power of God that is at work in and on and through that, that what we need to see, what we need to recognize, that as much as we kind of recognize that there is a, there's a devil, but we also see the, the, the work and the power of God and recognize that's what we desperately need. We, we desperately need and long for His power. And so that's what he's inviting us to. He's saying, okay, okay, if you see this whole spiritual war and you're, you're recognizing the enemy, then certainly you need to recognize you know, what God is doing and make sure that that's how you both see it and also how you enter into that. Now, I, I want to say that better. I'm not exactly sure, but I can tell you this. Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And so one of the pictures that's worked for me, one of the illustrations, if you want to think about it that way, it's a reality, but it gives us a window of that, is a way where we get to see this battle take place in an Old Testament scenario. So keep your finger here in Ephesians, but I want you to turn with me over to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17. So turn over there, Genesis, Exodus, should be pretty easy to find, second book in your Bible, uh, page number on the screen if you're using one of the church Bibles that are there, and I want you to see the very first battle that Israel has that becomes in many ways definitive of all the rest of their battles as they begin to kind of, you know, leave the promised land with Moses, going through the Red Sea kind of thing, and, and then this reality where they begin to see that, and there's a Uh, an incredible reality. It has much that we could talk about, more than we'll fully comprehend here, but we need to see it. So let's just read the section, then we'll come back and talk about it. Verse 8 says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up onto the top of the hill. So it was, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek, from generation to generation. Okay, one more time. There's just a bunch here. There's no way to dive into all the cool things that are a part of this, but I just want you to see this one part of it, that you get a chance to watch this battle. You get a chance to watch this warfare, and the thing that we want to just think through is, how is their victory this day? I mean, there is. They, they win. They, they defeat Amalek this day in battle, but where is that victory found? On one hand, we get to think about it, we have Joshua, and he gets an army of soldiers, and they literally go down and fight, right? On the other side of it, we get to see Moses, Aaron, and Hur. For Joshua and the army, they go out and fight. I mean, they literally enter into the valley, they, they take their weapons, they go out to, to do battle. But again, Moses, Aaron, and Hur, they're up on the hill holding up their hands, which is a picture in the Old Testament of prayer that's always kind of pictured that way. They're just saying, hey, they're depending on God and, and, and seeking Him, and I want you to see that. Now, we want to talk about that, but let's just go back to it for a moment, and let's recognize what doesn't carry the day, where the power that wins this day isn't found, that we might think it's found. Now, again, we're thinking about it looking at Joshua, but we're also thinking about ministry, We're thinking about people representing God, whether they be churches or missionaries or evangelists. 
I want you to look at it and say, I want to tell you, I think you get to see the same thing. So where is victory found? Where is, how, does the, how is the battle won? How is it, how has that happened? Is it weapons? You know, is it in that sense that the key that carried the day is having the very best armaments that could be possibly found? Is it great swords or longbows or maybe battle axes? I mean, could it be that those, no, well, they probably were a part of that day. We know certainly a sword was because it talks about Joshua and his sword, but that wasn't the key to winning the battle. It really wasn't having to do with how much or, or what, you know, kind of weapons or tools that they had in carrying out the day. If we were to carry that again into a modern day kind of understanding, I'll say it another way, that not only is it not weapons, it's not the ability or the financial backing that would kind of, you know, supply all that's there. And, and I, I wish I could spend a bunch of time on this, but I'll just tell you, we are uniquely in a very dangerous place as Americans because we are more affluent than most of the world and more affluent than the church has been in lots of places. And the danger is sometimes we begin to think that money is the key to ministry, that it really would be, hey, if we could have the biggest tools, if we could have the greatest weapons, if we could have, you know, more, I mean, that would be the thing that would win the day. That would be the thing. And I just want to tell you, it wasn't there. It isn't now. It isn't about the weapons. That was not what won the battle. It wasn't about the number of soldiers. It wasn't determined by how many soldiers Joshua took into the battle. It wasn't that he had an overwhelming number, nor was that the, the key to victory or losing. It really didn't have anything to do with that. But one more time, we tend to think that way. We have a propensity of thinking, if we had more people, that would be more ministry. If we, could, if we could get more people involved, that would be the thing that would carry the day. But it's not that way. It's not found in the number of people. It's not found in the number of soldiers. What about charisma or skill? I mean, is this because Joshua is particularly just one of those, you know, brilliant and powerful men that leads? Well, again, I know I'm saying the same thing again and again, but no. It really had nothing to do with Joshua. It wasn't his skill. It wasn't his charisma. It wasn't his personality that won the day. But again, we have a propensity to thinking sometimes that's the key to really powerful ministry, that we think it's about personalities. It's about great skills. It's about all the things, but that's not really what carried this day in that day. Or, you know, in the midst of, of all that that would be and the things that would happen there, what about strategies? Where, they, where you could think, okay, well, Joshua had a very good, you know, they, they obviously probably had a strategy, right? I mean, they go into the valley, and they're just, you know, he probably divides, okay, you guys fight over here, and you guys fight over here, and we're going to put our archers over here. I mean, they probably did all those things, but it wasn't the key to victory. It, that's not the thing that carried the day. That's not the thing that, that brought everything to pass. I mean, we know what it is. You already saw it, but go back and see it again. Verse 11, so it was, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. That's as simple as it gets. So when Moses' hands are raised, when it's this picture of prayer and dependence, Israel's winning. When his hands fall down, they're losing. I mean, I just want you to try to imagine. I don't know how good of imagination you have, and you could kind of just picture this for a moment. And in one sense, just recognize that you would have a propensity to, to not see it this way. I mean, if you were watching this day, maybe as some news reporter, you would be like, okay, and Joshua and his troops. I mean, you'd be looking at the battle and think, okay, this is the key. You know, we're watching this move forward. And you would think it would really have all to do with that. And then you would think, but I don't understand what's happening. And then you would watch. And there's this Moses here on a hurt. And so his hands go up. It's like, wait, when, when he's doing that, they're winning. When, when he's doing that, the, the battle that's happening here, they're actually victorious. And then you would look over here, and his hands get tired, and they go down, and all of a sudden, the battlefield reverses, and Amalek starts winning. And you would, you would have to say, okay, I, there's something happening there that is more important than what's happening here, or something happening there that's actually determining the outcome here. And I just want to tell you, if it works for you like it does for me, this is one of those places that just grabs my mind, grabs my very imagination and thoughts, because here's what I know. Hey, Joshua had to go out and fight. Obedience is necessary. It, had Joshua not gone into the valley, the victory wouldn't have been found. 
Had he not stepped out and said, okay, well, I'll, I'm, I'm going to take it on. I'm going I'm to go and do what God said. That would be needed. But then the real power comes as Moses, Aaron, and Hur are this picture of prayer. That what brings about this victory this day is this, that if I could just say it to you this way, if you could see anything that is making advancement in the kingdom of God today, if there is eternity things happening, then I will tell you, I think it's those two things. I think it's simple obedience and prayer. I think it's that people are literally upholding, and, and where there is strong prayer, there is strong impact. And it's this call to see that, okay, that's where, where is our strength found? It's not in the things of the flesh. It really is the things of God. I think about what it tells us in Zechariah, where it says, you know, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This isn't going to be by might. This isn't going to be by, you know, military or financial or personality. It says, that's not what I'm doing. That's not what I'm getting behind. I want to be a place where it's God's power that's working, where God would be the one that's doing this, that God would be the one that's making that happen. And what I want to tell you is Paul believed that. He believed that because in every letter he would plead, hey, guys, I need your prayers. And I want to tell you, I think it's changing the world where this is happening. But the great need is that it would happen. So let me come at it a different way. I want to just show you a number of quotes, and I'm using more quotes this morning than I would normally use in a message, but somehow just having a a multitude of counselors, I want you to hear it from other people and the way that they would say it, that would say the same thing. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said it this way. He says, I confess frankly that from my innermost heart, I attribute the large prosperity which God has given to this church vastly more to the prayers of of the people than anything else. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers in history who literally shook the world, that, that caused his, the, the, the gospel to go forward in incredible power there in England and literally throughout the world, the world and, and saw massive number of people turning to Christ and growing. He says, you know what? The reason we're doing this is because our people pray. So the only reason, the only reason we're seeing success is that we have a praying church, that they believe this. He says a prayerful church is a powerful church. How much better we might preach if our people prayed more for us. I mean, it's like prayer is really what does work this whole reality. Andrew Murray said it this way, the man who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to world evangelization in history. He says, if we could just get people to believe it, if we could just get people to believe that prayer is what changes everything, this dependence on God, Ian Bounds kind of pictured it this way, He says, those given to praying for their pastor are like poles, which hold up the wires along which the electric current runs. They are not the power, but they hold up the wires upon which the divine power runs to the hearts of men. He says, if you could really see this, that that people who really believe this, where where the gospel is going forward and people are happening, where pastors are preaching or evangelists are going, it's like this connection that prayer makes between, you know, what's happening there in the hearts of people. It is incredibly powerful. J. Vernon McGee said, every work must have prayer behind it if it's to succeed. Every successful evangelist and preacher of the word and every teacher of the word who is being used of God has people who are praying for him. Again, he just says it really well. He says, every work needs it. In fact, so much so, if it's successful, then you would be able to find there's people praying for it. There's no other way. There's no other way for God's work to go forward. There's no other way that happens unless people really get there. Evan Roberts, who was a, just greatly used in the revivals back in the late 1800s, said prayer, in the early 1900s, said prayer is the secret of power. It really is the, the place where we see that move forward. Leonard Ravenhill said the ch- true church lives and moves and has its being in prayer. He says the real church is this. I mean, it literally began in a prayer meeting. If you go back to the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit pours out, it starts as people are gathered to pray. And the church is finding its strength and its power there. R.A. Torrey said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil. He mocks at our wisdom. But he trembles when we pray. When we pry. I just, I just think that says it. Wow. Maybe even locking it again into this reality of spiritual warfare, what makes incredible impact into our world is, is that when we recognize what we need isn't human, 
It isn't, it isn't money. It isn't, it isn't, it's, we need God. And when, when God's people believe this and begin to see that take place, it literally can change the world. It literally can become so much a part of everything that is there. And I'm just telling you how powerful this is. I'm just inviting you to see how real this is. Just long that God would draw that home better. Again, it's one of those things that the danger is I'm not sure you believe me. Or if you believe me, I'm not sure you really do. I mean, it's one of those places where, you know, we're at church, so if I asked you, like, do you think prayer is powerful? You would have to answer, well, like, yes, of course I believe that. You know, it's like, who would say I don't believe in that? But when we really want to see things happen, when we really want to see the world touched for Jesus, when we really want to see things going forward positively in a world that is broken, we so often easily look to other things and believe in other things to be powerful, and they are not. And he's inviting us into this place where we see that. Okay, so we're seeing the connection. We have a little bit of a picture. Let's go back to our text. So if you're there in Exodus, you can turn back now with me to Ephesians, and let's dive in and see, okay, so Paul's doing this. This is kind of the context. This is what he's saying. What exactly is he asking for prayer for? Like, what is it that he's saying, hey, I need this. You should be praying for this. Well, let's notice. He says there in verse 19, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul asks for a number of things here in prayer, a number of things that are pretty consistent in the places where he asks for prayer in all of his other letters. Maybe one of the interesting things is to notice what he doesn't ask for prayer for. Yeah, he doesn't ask for prayer that he would get out of prison. He's in prison. I don't know if you caught that. He's in chains. He's literally chained to a Roman guard. Right now, he's under arrest. He's in prison in the midst of, uh, of a really difficult, you know, kind of space in, in, in the midst of it. And one of the amazing things is he doesn't ask for them to be praying that he gets out. He, he, he's, he's, he doesn't say, hey, okay, you know, I'm in prison, and you should be praying that I get out of prison, that I would get out of the hard space that I'm in, that the, the way the world is treating me wrongly or the way things are happening wrong in my life, hey, you should pray I get out of that. He doesn't pray for that. He, he, he doesn't ask for that. He views his situation as a sovereign setup. I mean, just a fascinating way that he puts it. You can go and look at it there in verse 20. He says, for which I am an ambassador in chains. It's like, I'm in chains, but I'm here to represent Jesus. I've been put here. I've been sent into this situation to represent Jesus. And, and he recognizes that life is so much that, just believing that where we are, we're there on purpose, and that God is working. It's a powerful reality that he's beginning to just kind of lay out to us. Now, let me just quickly say, it's not wrong to pray for somebody physically, or would even pray for that. Honestly, Paul would even ask for this in the book of Philippians, or at least make note of it. In the book of Philippians, when he talks about this, you know, that your prayers might see me delivered, Paul would say, and, and just kind of talks about that reality. So please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm definitely not saying, hey, we should never pray for physical protection or physical rescue, but I am going to say it's certainly not the most important thing. It's certainly not the most important thing. But unless I'm greatly mistaken, if we were to kind of call together the prayers that people pray for missionaries and pastors, I would just, again, just make a guess. Again, I don't know. I can't see what everybody's praying for. But my guess is that for many of them, this is where they spend the majority of their time. Hey, let's just protect them, you know, like rescue them, provide for them. I mean, you know, protect them from the, you know, all that's happening around them. And again, I'm just saying that's not a bad thing, but it's certainly not the most important thing. In fact, the things that Paul asks for prayer for are probably the things that are rarely actually prayed for. What things? Well, he gives us just a few of them here. Notice with me again, he says there in verse 19, he says, and I want you to pray for me that utterance may be given to me. 
says, I want you to, to, to pray for me that I would have words. I want you to pray for me that I would have utterance, that I would have something worth hearing, that I would have a message, that I would have a, a place that that would look like, that I would have words given so that I could speak them. Now, that's a powerful thing. I just want you to think about this for a moment and, and just recognize what he's saying. I mean, he's longing to speak for God in that situation. Now, quick FYI, in other places, sometimes he would actually include in this request also praying for opportunity, praying for open doors. Not a bad request, again, a good one. But here he's just recognizing he already has an open door. He recognizes where he is as a sovereign setup. And so he's saying, I, I'm just, I'm needing your help because I need, I need to say the right thing. I need to say the powerful thing. I need to have utterance given. So let's just pause for a moment. And I just want to honestly ask you, just between you and Lord, do you ever pray for that? I mean, do you ever, or, or do you even understand that your prayers and prayers of people is that which gives that? See, my concern is that I fear we live in a generation that sometimes we think that if a pastor gets up to give a message and he's able to articulate it well and clearly, we think it's the pastor. Boy, you're so smart. <laughs> I love the way you do that. You know, you kind of, you know, you must have worked really hard to do that. And again, that's not that we don't do that. I mean, Joshua still had to go into the valley to fight. I mean, he still had to swing the sword. But what Paul recognizes is what I'm telling you is that if it's really going to be effective, then it's carried spiritually, not naturally. That it isn't the brilliance of the man or the woman. It isn't the, the elbow grease it isn't the education, it, it, it isn't the, you know, the personality, it isn't, you know, the, the voice, it isn't that they have, it, it's, it's prayer. If it's powerful, it's prayerful. And, and if, if someone literally has something, he says, I, 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 if I have something that people can hear, and they'll hear from God, it has to come from him. And I'm needing you to pray for that, Paul says, and I'm saying the same thing. I'm saying that it, it must come from that. So he says, I need words. <laughs> I, I need to have a message. I need to have something that will communicate clearly into this. I need God to give me that. Would you pray for that, he says. Then he says, again, just picking up in verse 19, and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly. He says, I need, I need you to pray for words, then I need you to pray for boldness. Now, this is one's powerful because he actually says it twice. Not only does he say, you know, I can open my mouth boldly, but there in verse 20, again, he says, I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly, which is what I, I ought to be doing. That's, that's what people need. I, I need a, a boldness that's given to me. I, I need an ability to, to communicate. Now, this is a powerful thing to think through for a moment. What is boldness? What does he mean biblically by boldness? The word literally speaks of a freedom, of, of without restriction. Sometimes those restrictions can be fear. Sometimes it can be situations. But I would put it to you, I think it's so much more. I, I think really when the Bible speaks about boldness, and we see it like in the book of Acts, and we see it here, it's more than human, it's divine. It's God's power at work that's connecting his truth into the lives of people. It is that word that I put there on the screen, unction, which is kind of a funny word, but it's one that has been stuck in, in hearts of, of, of pastors and preachers for generations to say, hey, there's something here that is an unction, that is something that's not human, it's divine. In fact, I think about it this way. When Paul would speak about it in 1 Corinthians, he says it this way. He says, I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. So, so I came and I preached the gospel, it wasn't me. It wasn't that I'm brilliant or smart or had some great, you know, human argument that brought about, you know, the work in you. He says, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He says, when I gave the gospel, it wasn't me, it wasn't my personality, it wasn't my words, it was God. It was God. It was, it was His power that opened up to you the truth. It was the work of the Spirit so that if you got it, you didn't end the day thinking, wow, that pastor sure is amazing. No, it was like, God, you're amazing. God, you're, you're opening up truth to me. I'm getting it. I'm understanding. This is some radical thing that is massively divine. 
Let me give you a couple other quotes. Martin Lloyd Jones, one of my favorite preachers of old, said it this way. He says, there is all the difference in the world between preaching, merely from human understanding and energy, and preaching and the conscious smile of God. He says, it's one thing just to get up and you're just kind of, you know, doing the same thing that a, you know, English school teacher teaches in English. I mean, they're just kind of relying on stuff they learn. There's something entirely different when it's God. When, when all of a sudden there's like a smile of God, and I love that kind of idea, that his, his smile is upon what you're doing. He says this unction or this smile of God is the anointing. It's the supreme thing. It's God's unmistakable presence attending and empowering the preaching of his truth. It's where God himself is being known. It's his power upon that work. He says it lifts beyond the efforts and endeavors of a man into a position which the preacher is being used by the Spirit and becomes a channel through whom the Spirit works. Again, it's just a powerful reality saying, okay, here's what it is, that there is this thing that what Paul is saying there in Corinthians, it's not people. It's not persuasive words of human wisdom. It's the power of God. It's a demonstration of the power of God so that people's hearts would rest in that. And so he recognized the need of that so much so one more time he recognized where it comes from. So how do you get that? How do we get to that place where God's message is connecting with God's people with a bold impact? Well, again, I'm just going to go back to my picture there in Exodus 17. I'm just inviting you to recognize it's not actually in the soldiers in the valley. I mean, they had to go. They had to fight. Joshua had to lead the troops. They had swords. They swung those swords. They fought but that wasn't where the power was found. The power was found with Moses up on the hill. And I'm inviting you to understand, hey, pastors have to do what they are called to do. Missionaries have to go out into the the field. Standing right here for me, there's a place of obedience, but understand this, this isn't where the power comes from. It's not coming from my brain, heart, or or personality. If there's a work happening now, if it is in any way happening now, then it's God. And if it's happening, then I'm going to tell you, somebody was praying. Somebody was praying. We may not be able to trace it till we get to heaven, but it's going to surprise us. It's going to surprise us. We often think, well, you know, it was Billy Graham. He was so amazing. He had this great ability to communicate truth, or it was, you know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, or it was somebody, and they were just so brilliant. And then we're going to get to heaven and find out it really wasn't them. There was this person who was a prayer warrior over in their house, this little old lady who nobody ever knew, nobody ever understood, her prayers changed the world. Her prayers were were powerful because she believed. And and it's as if you would look there and you would say, you know, kind of that whole Exodus 17, you'd look at the battle and think, you know, I thought that. I don't understand why it's either making an advance or it's going back. And and then you would look, oh, it's over there. (laughs) It's over there. That's where the power was. The power wasn't there, it was there. The power wasn't in the, in, in, in the military might, it was in the prayers of God's people. And I'm just telling you, it's always been that way. It's always going to be that way, and it's a, a, a need that we have to see it. He did have one more request, though. Let's go back and see it. So it's kind of in the midst of it, it kind of is saying the same thing, but in another way. Verse 19, he says, And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may make open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He says, if I do this well, if I have right words and there's boldness, then the gospel is going to be known. People will understand the good news about Jesus and they'll be saved. And that's the message. I mean, that's what we're longing, right? God so loves the world, he sent his son into the world and we're longing for people to be saved. We're longing for people to, to get right. But I'm just going to pause again and say, so how do you think that happens? Do you think it's the brilliance of a pastor of evangelist? Do you think anybody has ever been argued into the kingdom of God because somebody gave them a brilliant argument? I'm telling you, no. I'm going to tell you, it was never. It was never the brilliance of a man or a woman. It was God. It was God opening up his truth to them so that even in the foolishness of the message preached, people believed and they get saved. So that it would happen maybe even right now. Maybe you're here in this room or maybe you're tuning in online. And the crazy thing, it's not really because I'm articulating it really well or saying it, you know, with, you know, kind of human wisdom, but there might really be a sense that you're being drawn, almost inexplicably drawn 
It's like, I don't even know. Like, I need that. I need, I, I need that. I need, I, I, I see that there's power. I need God. I need him in my work and in life. I'm telling you, that's a great reality. But I'm telling you, if that happens, it's because people pride. It's because people do that, and I just wanted to invite you into seeing this. Now, maybe you already do this. Maybe, like, I'm telling you something, you're like, Jim, I do that. Like, I get, I get this, and, and I understand, and I'm just going to tell you, I know that certainly some of you do. There's no way that we would be a church, that we would be able to be sustained in this world without it being some that believe that, but I'm just telling you we need to believe it more. See, I spend my week in many ways trying to get words, get utterance, and then to try to figure out how to communicate that with boldness. I do that, longing to communicate the gospel. But I know this, if that's going to work, then I need you guys, and I need prayer. But so does every missionary, so does every pastor. Into a place that we'd say, okay, I get it. I mean, I get it, and I'm going to pray for that. And one more time, maybe you do, but I think I'm talking to someone that's like, I have never prayed for that. I mean, I've never even thought that prayer was how that happened. I never thought that I should be praying for my pastor or the missionary to have words, that God would give them something to say, that give them right things to say. I never really thought about it, or never really thought that they need boldness, they need this connection, they need this power where the words are carried into the hearts of the people of God. I didn't really think that through. And then sometimes I just thought the gospel was, you know, if I could just, you know, get somebody who's really good at sharing the gospel, like I could argue them into the kingdom instead of recognizing, no, that's not what we need. We need divine power that the gospel would be known. And I'm telling you, what makes this so powerful is this is a reality that's happening in our community, it's happening in this church, it's happening around the world, and I think that there's a place that all of us are being invited to see this. All of us are being invited to pray for this. I don't think there's any that would say, God, well, that's not something I should pray for. Paul says, you know, hey, I want, if you're going to be involved in spiritual warfare, if you're going to recognize whether the gospel is under attack and people's souls are at war, then this should be a part of your way of doing battle. But I wonder if I'm speaking to somebody specifically. Again, I think it's for everybody. There's not any one of us here this morning that should say, hey, boy, I didn't really need that. I don't really need to do that. We all do. But I think I might be speaking to somebody that God has specifically called you to be a prayer warrior. I mean, he specifically invited you into a space of doing this. I might even be speaking to somebody that, you know, it, it's in this phase of life that he's inviting you to pray this way. I want to say this carefully, but again, just as, as, as honestly as I just felt like, you know, the Lord laid it on my heart to share, See, I think I'm speaking to somebody, and it might just be one person right now. And honestly, you're in that space where age has made life a little bit harder, where physically you're, you're less able to do things than you once were. So when a church makes announcements like needs in children's ministry or different ministry, you literally feel bad. Like, I wish I could do that. I'm no longer physically up to that kind of task. And part of it has started to make you feel useless to kind of make you feel like, you know, I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back because there's really no more point to my life. Uh, There's no more point to what I do with my life. Uh, There's not any, I I can't do children's ministry. I can't go onto the mission field. I'm not even there. And yet I believe that for some, maybe many, that in that phase of life, God is inviting you to be a prayer warrior. He's inviting you to, to touch the world through your prayers. And here's the really crazy thing it might become the most spiritually fruitful time in your life. Because it's a weird thing. When we're young and and physically able, sometimes we waste all our time doing things that mean nothing. I mean, and it's like, well, it's just, you know, I spend all my day and I'm so busy, I'm so distracted, and all of a sudden you can't do those things any longer, and you feel pointless, and yet there's a reality that, wait a second, I can be praying for a missionary who's serving over in Uganda. I can be praying power into their lives so that as I'm Moses up on the hill joining him, upholding those hands, the power is actually moving forward, and it might literally become the most powerful that you have ever been spiritually. I think about it this way. Corey Tim Boom said, the wonderful thing about praying is that you leave a world of not being able to do something and enter into God's realm where everything is possible. This is the amazing thing about praying is all of a sudden 
that which you could never do in your human strength, you enter into something that could accomplish things that you could never dream of any other way. Now, God calls us to that all the way through his word. He tells us in Hebrews that we should come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, that we should recognize, okay, as we come into God's presence, that's power, that we would recognize what he tells us in James, that the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Like, that'll change things. Like, prayer carries the day. So much so, he would tell us in James 4 that you don't have because you don't ask. That he would literally look, and again, kind of my Exodus 17 picture, he'd look and say, the reason the battle's going so poorly, the reason the enemy's winning is because you're not praying. Like, why, why do you think that's happening? Do you think it's them? Did you think they didn't have sharp enough swords? Did you think they needed more soldiers? Is that what you thought was going to win the day? It's not what wins the day. It is the power of prayer. It is this, and Paul believes it. I believe it. I'm inviting you into it. Well, let me give you one more quote, who says what I'm trying to say in great words that were true in his generation, and yet I find myself thinking, boy, if he could see our generation, he would say it only more. Ian Bounds said it this way. He says, we are constantly on a stretch, if not a strain, to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency of the gospel. He says, if you look at where we are, it seems like we're always like, how do we do this better? Like, you know, we got to come up with another plan, another way to, to share the gospel. I mean, we, we got to figure out another strategy. So, and he says, if you look at sometimes Christian work and the way it's done, we spend so much time trying this. He says, but what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more or novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. He says, you know what the church needs? It needs people praying. It needs men and women who believe it and say, God, we need you. There's nothing else that can do this. This isn't something that's going to be won by human might or human wisdom. We don't need powerful personalities. We don't need more money. We need power. We need that which can only come from God. And as God's people believe that power happens, and so Paul is pleading it, and I'm pleading for it as well, just saying it this way. I don't know if you see it that way. Because as we think about it this way, I'm telling you, there's an evil happening in our world today. There, there's things happening around our world, but it's not politicians. And it's not the media. It's the devil. And there's power happening in our world today. People are believing in Jesus today. Lives are being transformed. People are growing in Christ. But it's not churches, and it's not personalities, and it's not techniques. It's God. It's His power. And you're invited to say, I believe that, and I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to pray for that. I, I, I'm just going to tell you as clear as I can, I'm asking for that prayer. Paul had no problem asking for it. I have no problem asking for it. I'd love you to pray for me. Pray I have words to share, a way to share it that the gospel wouldn't be known. But I'm inviting you to pray. Maybe you would adopt. Maybe, maybe you'd adopt praying for me. I would take it. But maybe you would adopt a missionary and say, you know what? I'm going to pray for him every day, and I'm going to start praying for God's work to go forward. I'm going to start believing that it's not human ability, but it's God's ability. It's God's power that comes through prayer that changes the world. And I want to tell you, that is a powerful invitation. And it's a good reality. And there is hope found there. Well, that's where we're going to end with this morning. That's where we're going to close this kind of series on spiritual war for a place where we're being invited to stand, but also advance to see God's work happen in great ways. And I'm longing that you would be a part of that. So let's do this. I want to invite you to do it right now. I want to invite you just to take a moment to pray. It's a quiet moment between you and the Lord. Maybe you would pray for what's happening here. Or maybe right now there's somebody on your mind. There's a missionary that you're thinking, you know, I, I, I forgot. Sometimes I thought what they needed was money. Sometimes what I thought they needed was more people. Sometimes I thought they needed more tools. And I thought that, that would be the thing that would cause the gospel to go forward there. And I forgot. And I forgot that those are small things. They need an unction from God. They need words. They need power. They need connection. And maybe you would take a moment to pray for that missionary or that pastor that's on your heart right now that that would happen and you would recognize that it's God's power that's needed. So quietly, would you take a moment to do that? I'll do the same and then we'll close in worship in just a moment.
God, thank you for your word that shows us truth. So much we've seen in this series on spiritual warfare. I pray that that which you've shown us would be effective. Lord, that we'd see both the work of the enemy, but how in you and your power we can stand. And yet, Lord, not just us, but your work stand. The gospel go forward in this world, not by human strength, but by being strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. God, forgive us where we have leaned on other things, where we've looked to money or personalities or skills or techniques, thinking that would be the thing that could take the gospel into this generation. And it's not, it's you. We, we, we need your strength. You've called us to be a people who are made strong in you. God, help it to be so. Teach us to be those who depend on you. Pe- teach us to be a people who pray, who recognize it's your power we need above all else, and it's your power that wins the battle. God, we long to see that more, and I pray for it even right here and right now. May you be so glorified in your work take place in your strength. We ask for it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God teach us to pray. Well, guys, why don't you stand? We're going to close in a final song of worship. We're here to talk afterwards if that's you and need some prayer in that. But even again, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, and God is doing that work that inexplicably is drawing you to him, we would love to be a part of that. Come up and let us talk to you. But right now, we want to close in worship, and I want to bless you in God's name. May the Lord make his face shine upon you now and give you grace. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.